active volcanoes and creatures reminiscent of the dinosaurs. The tiny Sundar Islands are like something from a bygone age. This group of islands situated east of the Indonesian island of Java remained undiscovered for a surprising number of years. The mysterious inhabitants of Komodo Island, but most notably the beautiful landscape of the Sunda Islands, have transformed Bali into a world-famous island paradise. The inhabitants of Bali have good reason to be proud of their colourful culture. Balinese temple dancers are well known throughout the world. Balinese music is also impressive. Gamelan music is played throughout Indonesia. To Western ears, the gamelan may sound a little strange at first. It also accompanies the traditional barong dance. Indonesia's centuries-old religious rituals, culture and traditions are still observed by the population at large. In land, the countryside is beautiful. It's as though time stood still here many hundreds of years ago. The people work in the paddy fields without the aid of modern machinery. Bali's hot and humid climate is ideal for agriculture. Indeed, here they have three harvests a year. It takes around two and a half hours to fly to Timor, the easternmost of the small Sunda Islands. Its capital, Kupang, is situated on Lake Sau and has a population of 450,000. Timor's economy relies upon the trade attracted by its harbour. It was the region's fishermen who first laid the foundation stone for the development of Kupang. Today they continue to offer an abundance of fish for sale. Their catchers are a wonderful sight and come in all shapes and sizes. From Timor we travel west to Flores. This area of the archipelago contains several active volcanoes. Inland from Flores, the mountains are up to 2,400 meters above sea level. The airport that serves the 15,000 square kilometer island is situated in Malmere. The passengers are given a typically warm welcome. On the journey to the island's west coast, the terrain is mainly only accessible by jeep. The adventure is about to begin. The rugged terrain requires an experienced driver. In recent years, the three colourful crater lakes of the Kelemutu volcano have developed into a popular tourist destination on Flores. However, tourist destinations are not our only goal. We're going to venture off the tourist map.
As we travel inland, the landscape becomes more isolated. Thus, we're surprised to encounter farmers in this region. Riding on horseback, they're like an Asian version of the legendary cowboy. When meeting with strangers, the people of this region are at first a little shy, but their traditional greeting is most amicable. Foreigners are seldom seen in this remote part of the island, but they're always given a warm welcome. The villagers go about their work, surrounded by all the splendor of the shining blossoms of the local vegetation. However, these fields are not the norm. They contain wheat and not the customary rice. All the work is done by hand. The wheat is carried into the village in large baskets. The men thrash the wheat with their feet while making dance-like movements. An unusual technique, but it seems to work. Finally, the women pound the grain into flour. The entire village community works in harmony. Everyone is assigned a task. The coconut is part of the staple diet. Skillful climbers cut them from the trees. Next, the wilderness. Some of the villagers have informed us that the island of Flores contains a number of large monitor lizards. And it's not long until we discover this for ourselves. This one is extremely shy. These huge lizards are fascinating creatures. The island of Komodo contains the largest specimens. We decide to go in search of the monitor lizards. We travel by boat amid powerful currents. On the small nearby island of Rimja, we take the opportunity to explore the fascinating underwater world of this region. The view of the colorful fish is a splendid sight. The water is rich in plankton. It nourishes the fish as well as the coral. A large moray has come out of its hiding place from within a coral cave. Everywhere huge swarms of fish fill the water with life. To observe the synchronized movement of these huge shoals of fish is one of the most satisfying experiences in the underwater world of Rimja. The sand is also worth a closer look. It's also full of life. The villagers are more interested in our snorkels than in the beauty of nature. From here, it's only a few kilometers to the nearby island of Komodo. 
at Liang Beach on the east coast, daily life continues as normal. The village is made up of simple huts. The roofs are covered with palm leaves. It's a veritable paradise on earth. The villagers earn their living from fishing and they also keep a number of domestic animals. So the sight of dogs and even pigs on the beach is quite usual. This small settlement and its surroundings could hardly be more idyllic. Food is in abundance here. That probably accounts for the smiling faces. But even on Komodo, life isn't always perfect. A dead, though poisonous, sea snake held by a young boy is a reminder that life here can also be dangerous. Life in the village is tranquil, although there is much work to do. Everyone is given a task. Most of what is needed here, the villagers make for themselves. Eventually, everyone begins to take it easy. When evening comes and the sky gradually loses the red glow of the setting sun, it's then that the villagers also become aware of the splendor of their homeland. Both the island and the sea are gradually cloaked in darkness. Family life is important for the entire village community. Each family lives in perfect harmony. Next morning, we begin our search for the legendary Dragons of Komodo. The village chief accompanies us. He knows exactly where the monitor lizards live. He'll accompany us throughout the expedition. After the men have surveyed the surrounding area, they prepare a trap for the lizards. A second group has traveled inland, as so far the lizards have not been seen on the coast. The dense vegetation of the forests and savannas is a perfect hiding place for the monitor lizards of Komodo. The bait, a freshly slaughtered goat, has managed to attract a number of the huge lizards. A particularly curious lizard watches the men as they prepare a trap. As soon as the traps are set, we must play a waiting game. We use this time to recover from our exertions and to relax. Some are so relaxed that they fall asleep. Finally, after three hours, the lizards arrive. Hunger combined with the smell of the dead goat attracts several of these creatures. It was only at the beginning of the 20th century that the lizards of the small Sunda Islands were first officially classified.
Various pearl divers and Dutch soldiers were the first to discover the monitor lizards. At first they feared that the lizards would belch fire as they looked like dragons, but their fears proved to be unfounded. Next, another hungry Komodo lizard appears. This particularly large specimen cannot resist the tempting smell of a dead goat. The huge lizards are true beasts of prey. Scientists once believed that the monitor lizard ate mainly carrion but this has since proven to be untrue. The dragons of Komodo are highly effective hunters. This one takes its prey into the bushes where it can eat in peace. In addition to its long, compact and muscular body, it's mainly the lizard's head and its up to 40 centimeter long tongue that usually frightens most people. The lizards are delighted by their unexpected feast. Normally they have to fight for their food, but they're fine hunters. Adults know how to wait patiently for their prey. Sometimes they must wait for several days for their next meal. The bait is eventually moved to another location. The monitor lizards have disappeared into the bushes. The bait has been moved to a safer position for the cameraman and it's also easier to film in this spot. The appearance as well as the hunting methods of the up to three meter long monitor lizards changes as they develop. The young are fine looking creatures and more slender than the adults. Unlike the adults, they live mainly in the trees. They usually feed on insects such as beetles and grasshoppers and geckos and other lizards are also consumed by the young Komodo monitor lizards. The trees also help to protect them. When the Komodo monitor lizard is hungry, not even its own offspring is safe. But as time passes by and the lizards become larger and heavier, they gradually lose their ability to climb trees. After growing to around one and a half meters in length, the lizards live mainly on the ground and sleep in caves that they dig out themselves. The bigger they get, the larger their appetite grows for food. The adult monitor lizard can even attack large mammals such as wild boar and deer. It's amazing how soon they can devour such large animals.
After having had such a close look at these incredible creatures, we return to the village. We soon arrive. While we were visiting the Komodo monitor lizards, the women of the village were hard at work. The ikat art of weaving has for hundreds of years been undertaken on each of the Sunda Islands. Both young and old women weave. It's a highly important skill, the only real art form on the islands. The ikat weaving patterns are created according to age-old traditions that have been handed down from one generation to the next. Even today, they are influenced by ritual and mystique. In this part of Komodo, there aren't any shops of any kind. Here, the necessities of life are produced by the local population, using things like leaves off this palm tree. Despite their hard life, these people are happy and content. The strong sense of family life here strengthens their community spirit. So they live in harmony with nature. The surrounding wilderness has many dangers. It's believed that a number of Komodo monitor lizards have been seen close to the village in the vicinity of a small pond. In the past, children have fallen victim to the huge lizards, so the villagers are extremely watchful. The rooster also senses danger. But for the rooster, it's too late. The Komodo monitor lizard has attacked it with a fatal bite. The poisonous mucus in the lizard's mouth is already taking effect. For this 140 kilogram predator, the rooster is easy meat. But it's only a light snack for the lizard, as its hunger is almost insatiable. The Komodo monitor lizard is able to eat an entire wild boar. The villagers are always on the lookout for these large reptiles as they can easily attack their domestic animals. It's impossible to predict when they will reappear. The villagers were once permitted to kill the lizards. But today the lizard population is endangered, so the monitor lizard is a protected species. The villagers do their best to protect themselves but their most important time is spent fishing. The men of the village are skillful fishermen. Their fishing trophies are given pride of place. And the sun gradually begins to set. Those who come here are enchanted by the beauty of this place. A truly memorable experience. Our next destination is the island of Lembata. 
The village of La Malera is situated in the south of the island, an area that has little fertile land that is suitable for agriculture. The people here depend entirely on fishing. The villagers are renowned for the fact that they're the last whale hunters of the subtropics that continue to hunt with harpoons. The first records of this region's stout-hearted whale hunters dates back to the 17th century. Portuguese seafarers were the first to report the hunting methods of the islanders. Their various writings mention that the whale hunters of La Malera collected the oil of the huge mammals and offered it for sale. At the beginning of the 19th century, whale hunters from the North American village of Nantucket came to this part of the world to hunt for the sperm whale. Today, whale hunting is severely frowned upon. Due to the development of more accurate and lethal weapons, plus well-organized ships, some species of whale are now almost extinct. But on the island of Lembata, the people don't hunt the whale for commercial reasons, but because it is the basis of their survival, as the lava stone on the island makes agriculture almost impossible. Dense tropical vegetation and magnificent ferns are rare in this section of the coast. For centuries, the palm tree has proved to be the most important material for the construction of the simple huts on La Malera Island. Despite the humble living conditions of the islanders, they are extremely hospitable. As soon as we arrive, we are given our very own hut. La Malera, the village of the whale hunters, is an impressive place. In recent years, it's also been the setting for various films. The village children aren't phased by our presence, and we're soon treated to a fascinating insight into the daily life and traditions of the villagers. Little has changed in the way in which they live. Machinery and electricity are almost unknown on Lembata. Here, life thrives on time-honored skills. Old-fashioned and proven work methods are the order of the day here. The islanders are happy with their lot. The breeding of goats, pigs and chickens provides the people of La Malera with a diet other than fish, although the sea is vital to their daily life. Suddenly news comes that two whales have been caught, which causes great excitement. Whaling ensures the survival of the villagers. Depending on the tide, the whales are slaughtered either on the beach or in the sea. They have little time to disembowel the whales because when the tide is at its height, the work must be carried out quickly. The blood in the water can attract unwanted visitors, such as the shark.
The slaughter and cutting up of the animals is not for the faint-hearted. But it's so vital to the islanders that they think nothing of it. Almost the entire village has gathered on the beach to watch. Even the children take the sight of the dead whales in their stride. The slaughter and disemboweling of the whales is only done by the men. The women and children simply watch. Each of the men possesses his own sharp knife and grinding stone for the arduous work. The rubber-like skin of the whale is between 10 and 12 millimeters thick. Even with their sharp knives, it is difficult for the men to cut it. The work requires much strength. Of particular interest to the whale hunters from Nantucket was the sperm whale's valuable layer of fat, known as blubber. The oil that was produced by the whale fat was once an important fuel. It was used to illuminate entire cities. The huge sea mammals and especially the sperm whale also contain another important material. The gut of a sperm whale contains a valuable substance, ambra. Up to 400 kilograms of this have been found in a single sperm whale. Amber was once used for the production of perfume, although fresh amber has an unpleasant smell. It's only after it's been exposed to both air and daylight for some time that amber takes on a firmer consistency and also releases a more pleasant aroma. Amber was first discovered floating in the sea. It was only later found to emanate from the gut of the sperm whale. The discovery of this extremely rare and expensive substance, as well as the development of modern industrial hunting methods, almost led to the extinction of the sperm whale. During only a few years, tens of thousands of these creatures were killed for profit by countless fleets of whalers. The whale hunters of La Malera make no money from their prey. For numerous generations, the villagers have owed their survival to the whale. As soon as one side of the animal has been disemboweled, work begins on the other. According to tradition, the whale is shared out among the entire village community. Some of it will go to a nearby mountain tribe that settled in this region long before the whale hunters. In return, the villagers are allowed to take the animals to their land for grazing. The 20 centimeter long teeth of the whale are used as barter by the islanders. They once had a flourishing trade with the Chinese who offered various goods to the whale hunters in return for the valuable whale teeth and also iron for the production of harpoons. During the hunt for the whales, some of the men have caught a three and a half meter long shark. The 
Fresh fish and whale meat are transported on the islanders' backs to the higher-lying village of La Malera, and the blood is left behind on the beach. This work is also carried out by the men. The older inhabitants of the village wait in eager anticipation for the tasty bounty. After the meat has been cut into small pieces, it is hung up to dry. The meat is preserved naturally by the heat of the day combined with a healthy sea air. The whale meat is hung up to dry throughout the entire village and for some days gives off a very pungent odor. The oil that drips down from the meat is caught in various bins and is then filtered. Finally, it is stored in bamboo containers. There is little waste. The smell that consumes the entire village appears to excite the animals. Even the newborn of the local animal population are attracted by the smell of the drying meat and the pigs also seem interested. The whale hunters of La Malera take pride in their hunting trophies. Each one, one without the aid of modern technology. The constant battle with the sharks and sperm whales off the coast of Lembata is not without risk. But the men have no choice, for there's no other way of hunting here. They continue the heritage of their legendary ancestors and age-old traditions are still held in high esteem in this extraordinary village. The sea repeatedly deposits various fascinating treasures on the island. The shell of a nautilus is made into spoons and jewellery. The inhabitants of La Malera also extract salt with simple but effective techniques. The sea salt that is produced by way of evaporation is used in exchange for vegetables and wheat from neighboring villages that possess agricultural land and all the necessary skills that go along with it. Each day, various routine tasks are undertaken. Sails are repaired. Everything is done by hand. As this region has always lacked various essential materials, the villagers make their sails out of dried reed. The braided reed is divided into several small quadrangles and then sewn together. Thus, yet another sail sees the light of day. It is not only sails, blankets, baskets and roofs that are made out of reed. The ropes of the fishermen and whale hunters are also made of this material that mainly grows on the island's volcanic terrain. The thick rope is up to 20 meters long and is extremely strong. Without it, whale hunting would be impossible. Others repair boats that have been damaged during various whale hunting expeditions. Sometimes even entire boats can be lost in the hunter's struggle with the mighty sperm whale. Even the youngest inhabitants of the village playfully practice the work they will have to do when they've reached adulthood.
Food is running short. The most recent hunting trips have met with no success. The whales didn't come. And normal fishing will not provide the 1,400 inhabitants of the village with sufficient food. Some of them search for mussels on the beach. The people here are used to hard times, especially after numerous huge whaling fleets have almost caused the extinction of the whales in this region. Little remains from the last successful whale hunt. However, at the moment, the situation is only one of concern, not of desperation. But time is running out because it's already August and the whale hunting season ends in September. With the arrival of the temperate winds from Australia, the sea will become treacherous and the whaling boats will have to remain on shore. The main season finished some time ago and the whales have kept well offshore. The inhabitants of Lamalaris have no alternative but to hope and pray that their renewed endeavours will prove to be a success. With the first light of dawn, the men begin their long and dangerous working day. They're anxious to go out to sea. Now, every day counts. The small boats are pulled from the beach into the sea. Both young and old join in. The harpoons are already on board. Soon the men are out on the open sea. They will spend up to eight hours or more on these boats that are made without a single nail. They consist mainly of bamboo. If a whale attacked one of these boats, it would smash it to pieces. The traditional whale hunting boats of La Malera have a helmsman who sits at the rear. The crew prepares the sails. When the boats have reached a good speed, the men check their equipment once again. We're some way off the coast, the water here is very deep. A favorite place for the sperm whale. The tension rises. The men are afraid that they'll be unsuccessful and will have to return home without a catch. As soon as we arrive at our destination, the sails are dropped. The bait is prepared. Now, the men in the boats must wait. To prepare for their next encounter with the whales, the men light a small fire. In this, they heat up their old iron harpoons. But as in many previous weeks, there are no sightings. Yet all remains calm. In readiness for a possible kill, the men are becoming anxious as there's no sign of any whales. However, suddenly there's a whoop of joy as the patience of the whale hunters is rewarded. The pursuit of the whale begins. To improve maneuverability, oars are now used instead of sails. Okay. 
Using all their strength, the men follow their prey. Those who will cast the harpoons duly take their places. From a distance of only a few meters, the first strike is made. But unlike modern hunting, the whale is not killed immediately. The rowers use all their strength as the whale attempts to escape. But today, the men are having more luck. The whale fights for its life and pulls the boat behind it. In the meantime, further boats are chasing yet another whale. But that's not all. Two other whales are also in the vicinity. The harpoons are being put to good use today. Finally, after a hard struggle, the men succeed in surrounding all four whales with their boats. Now begins the dangerous part of the hunt. The men must dive into the blood-filled sea in order to cut into the lower side of the whales so that the water will enter their lungs. The blood attracts various sharks, but the whale hunters of La Malera don't show any fear of this at present. A couple of minutes later and the whales are dead. The water around the boats is red with blood. The weighty catch is secured by rope. It's necessary to be cautious as the struggle with the whales and the blood that is all around have attracted a number of sharks. Some of the men jump into the dangerous ocean. However, today they're fortunate. The sharks don't attack. Occasionally, the hazardous work of the whale hunter of La Malera also causes accidents, in spite of all their experience and special skills. Exhausted but content, the whale hunters return with their prizes to the village. Now their families will be able to eat in the weeks ahead. The active volcanoes and legendary lizards of Komodo, as well as the existence of the courageous whale hunters of the Sunda Islands, are truly evocative of a colorful and dramatic bygone age. <laughs>